said, um, this is going to be faster. We're going to start off with a full overview of the chapter. Me and Josh are going to be taking turns, giving you a little bit of summaries of different areas. Then after that, we're going to focus on the specific people and terms that we have to know. There's not going to be much addressing of the questions because I'm sure you did your homework. You can actually just read off of that. But we're going to give you general overviews and then specifics on the people. Okay, so where did we end? So we ended with um, Wilson being elected for his second term. His main um, campaign idea was that he kept us out of war. He was running on that, and people were like, oh, there's been this war going on, and we, America, have not gotten into it. Let's reelect Wilson, and he'll keep it this way. This was one of the promises Wilson failed to keep, um, and this was primarily caused by, by two main reasons. The first reason, um, the one that came first, was uh, where Germany, they, they, they started to not restrict any more of their submarine warfare. So they basically said any ship that they said that any ship that um, came into any of their their areas, they would completely destroy it. There, that would they wouldn't show any mercy. There was no like compromising with America with anyone. So this obviously was a very big problem that America had with this. That was the first reason. Second was a Zimmerman telegram that was sent from Germany to a German ambassador in Mexico. And what it said was that if uh, Mexico were to join the join Germany, then they would help Mexico regain their territory of the West. Obviously, this was a big deal because it made the people of the West living in America very unhappy, and that really motivated them for the war. Originally, it was just the East Coast that was very involved, but as soon as this came along, the uh, West as well was very geared towards fighting um, the war too. So now, Wilson had full support from most people. And even though he was, he had run on the idea of like keeping them out of war, they were sort of for the effort because they did not want all these people to be dying. Um, and specifically in the, I think the first week of March in 1917, um, three three U.S. merchant ships were blown up, and that affected a lot of the Americans. So. Now let's talk about how the country mobilized for war. Um, I mean, even after um, the Zimmerman telegram, Wilson still said he wouldn't go to war unless there was an overt act, and that overt act was when Germany blew up yet more submarines in March of 18, or 1918. Okay. Yeah. Well, was it 1918 or 1917? It was 17, right? 1918. That's when we entered the war. Okay. All right. Sure. Um, okay. So let's talk about how we mobilized for war. Um, first, you had the War Industries Board. Um, that was one of the big factors in like getting us ready to actually go to Europe to fight the war because we weren't doing it on our land. So the War Industries Board was led by multiple people, but the most notable one was Bernard Baruch. Um, he was the leader. He asked for volunteers to, in like key people in specific industries, to rather than selling their like domestic goods, to transfer over to military goods. So, for example, say you um, at the time were making some sort of like. I don't know, so you're making like lamps or something. He'd be like, okay, you're making lamps, now we want you to make guns for us. Um, and going from lamps to guns was a big deal because now they could send that those guns over to their allies and they could use them, America could use, could use them themselves in the war. Um, then they would, they, all this stuff for the industries that they would get would be shipped overseas and that would help them, you know, like, be ready for war. Um, then you have... Um, yeah, the question that arises is how, how would Bernard Baruch and the War Industries Board be able to enforce this? Uh, the War Industries Boards itself did not have any power. They relied on something that, in class, Mr. Melvin liked to call um, patriotic volunteerism. Uh, this was like 
say say you owned a company and you weren't listening to the War Industries Board and you continue to make lamps, then your friend at like the plastic factory would sort of be like, oh, you're being very disrespectful to America. You're not actually helping the cause for war. Um, and they would sort of like segregate you and this would peer pressure you into actually transitioning into making these industrial weapons and things that the War Industry Board was an advocate of. Um, so it was basically like a very simple form of peer pressure that actually got people motivated. Um, and a long-term consequence of this was that if you say no, people will think you're not patriotic, and then this slowly could have evolved into people thinking that you were like a German spy or you were violating the Sedition Act um, by hindering the war effort, and that could let, lead you end up in jail, and obviously no one wanted this, so they would obviously go along with the war effort. Um, and then there was the labor movement. Um, the labor movement was the War Labor Board, similar to the War Industry Board, but this was led by who else but William Howard Taft. Um, Woodrow Wilson handpicked him because uh, Taft was a former president. He thought he would be very qualified for this, and actually so leading something like the War Labor Board was one of Taft's strong points because, as you know, he didn't really want to become the president. He wanted to be like a Supreme Court justice, and this position at the head of the War Labor Board was something that he would actually excel at, um, unlike his presidency. Um, so purpose of the War Labor Board was to make sure people didn't go on strike, um, and it was, way, it was a way for the government to stop the strikes from happening, even if they were to occur. Um, and in terms of labor, there were like two, two things, two, like, I guess, unions that popped up. There was the American Federation of Labor, and the industrial um, industrial workers of the world. So the industrial workers of the world were nicknamed the Wobblies, and they were led by Big Bill Haywood. Um, and the American Federation of Labor was uh, led by Samuel Gompers. So you have these two industrial um, workers of the world was an industrial union that accepted all workers, whereas the American Federation of Labor, that was very selective, and it only let you in if you were a skilled worker. So there was a form of segregation there. American Federation of Labor set up like the craft union for people with skill versus non-skill, um, and it was very selective. Um, but because of it, because of the American Federation of Labor, the wages went up about 20%. Even though the wages did go up, so did the price of food and living at the time, so people would still complain about that fact. Um, then the Industrial Workers of the World, that group, um, it, ex it accepted all workers, and eventually people did go on strike, the unskilled workers, and people like Debs and Haywood were both jailed um, for, like I guess it was a violation of the Sedition Act. Um, I think... Debs was put away for 10 or he had a 10-year sentence. Um, and actually, Haywood, he was put in jail, but then he was also released, and then he ran away to, uh, I think, Russia to um, escape his situation. Um, so, yeah. So, Josh, you want to talk about, like, the migration and, like, black, the African Americans coming up from the South and how they contributed to the war efforts uh, and how they were they were still segregated in the war. Josh, you're muted. I can't hear you. All right. Well, Josh is trying to figure that out. Um, can't hear you still. I'll let you know when I can hear you, but uh, if you want, you can leave the call and then come back on. I'll talk about the migration. All right, so the Great Migration, you had the southern blacks moving north. Um, they were going from agricultural, um, agricultural setting to working on farms, and they were going to factories where they were working in industry. This was obviously a very big change for them. 
Um, and it was very, it was very, it wasn't very frequent that they would be recruited for a faction because there was so much job competition in the north. Um, but on the off chance that they did get recruited, they still wanted this opportunity. They still did um, come to the north because of it. Obviously, immigrants that were competing for the same jobs as these these African Americans did not like them because they were stealing their job opportunities because there were so many of them coming up. And then the the common like slogan or common phrase that came up was work or fight. And what this meant was that either you worked or you would have to fight. Um, obviously a lot of less people wanted to get into the war and get into these problems, so they did agree to uh, continue to work. All right, while we wait for Josh, I'll let you think of any questions that you have so far, and you can let us know. So, do you have any questions? Any, anything? All right, if you don't have any questions, I'll go on to the next uh, topic, which is the, the influence of women in the war effort. So the number of women that were working in the factories before the, the rising of the war was very, very minimal. Um, but eventually, a lot more women did join, and... Hold on a second. I'm working on getting Josh back on here. All right, so um, as far as women goes, um, there, there was going to be a lot more of them in the war at this time, and um, they knew that the men would return to the war after, after um, the war was over, so they knew in that time they had to fill the spot. And uh, the government did give pensions to women so that they could help their kids and it would encourage the growth of population. Um, and then um, regions, all right, let's see, what do we need to talk about? All right, so there was the National American Women's Suffrage Association um, and they were for the war effort. So because of this, Wilson decided to reward them, and he, because of this, he gave he like enacted the 19th Amendment, which said that everyone, regardless of your um, gender, would be able to vote. There was no way to deny this, um, and the 19th Amendment ensured that everyone would uh, have this ability to work. So you will see in the next presidential election. Um, women did have a set. Then let's talk about specifically the amendments. Um, previously in the last chapter you had the 16th amendment which talked about income tax. 
Um, this was in 1913. This had to do with progressive income, ta income tax. Based on your income, you'd have a certain amount of tax taxes. Then the Seventh Amendment was... The 17th Amendment was the direct election of senators, where select senators, rather than being appointed, would be elected by people. Then you had the 18th, 18th Amendment, which is prohibition. We didn't really talk much about this in class. Prohibition is where, um, like, you could not actually buy or sell alcohol, but this did not actually have anything to do with being able to drink alcohol, so that practice still continued. And then you have... Uh, the 19th Amendment, which I just spoke about, which was suffrage regardless of your gender. Uh, that was in 1920, so that came about then. All right, then let's talk about... We talked about industry, we talked about labor, now let's go into food. Food was a really big deal because of the same idea of patriotic volunteerism. It wasn't very enforced, but the Food Administration was led by Herbert Hoover, who um, eventually runs for president, and we find out that he doesn't do so well just because of the time period. But as far as the Food Administration goes, he actually does really well, um, specifically to uh, in Belgium. He sends a lot of food that we Americans like save to Belgium, and he ends up saving them. And this really um, makes people anticipate what he's going to do um, if he were to run for president. Um, and what the Food Administration regulated was, like, specific days where specific foods would not be allowed. For example, you would have, like, Meatless Mondays or Wheatless Wednesdays. Um, this is all an effort to conserve more food and it, to ensure that food was not being wasted. Um, and, again, this was enforced through patriotic volunteerism, which was when people would be, like, um, oh my god, you had meat on Monday? It's Beatless Mondays. How could you have meat? Um, this would be enforced through like communication like that. And, and, oh look, there we go. Josh is back. Right, Josh? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we right? can hear you. That's cool. Alright, I'm back. And oh. in case you didn't hear me earlier, I made a mistake when I talked earlier. Um, Wilson didn't ratify or didn't declare war till 19. He declared war in 1917, not 1918. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was getting at. Okay, so Josh, we I was just talking about the Food Administration. Um, cool, Hoover, I like that. Yeah, you want to talk about Victory Gardens and then go into the Fuel Administration. Fuel Administration, uh, they kind of stole many of the tactics of the Food Administration. Like the food administration had like porkless Sundays, meatless one or meatless Mondays, wheatless Wednesdays. The fuel administration had like heatless Fridays or gasless Tuesdays to encourage people to ration fuel for the war effort. And this was equally as successful as the um, food administration in helping make sure that there's more fuel for tanks in the war. All right, so also the Fuel Administration was led by a man named Harry A. Garfield, um, and he selected, like, local administration for local areas to um, help with the Fuel Administration. Um, and they, like, set up and enforced different prices of coal, and um, actually the Fuel Administration had to do with, like, daylight savings time, and they were the first people to actually, like, present the idea and actually make use of it. All right, so then there was also the railroads, um, and you're probably wondering how the government could take over railroads because they were, like, within the state. But actually, railroads uh, operated as interstate, so that was something that the government did have jurisdiction over, so they were able to control railroads and then, um, like, make decisions based on that. And actually, uh, railroads are the only ones that were operated by a voluntary system because... The government knew that it was more important than rationing food and fuel, so they couldn't uh, rely that people would um, just volunteer to like give up the railroad to the government, so they forcefully took it from the railroad companies because it was needed to bring supplies all over the company and bring them to the war effort. Exactly. Okay. So 
Then there was, okay, so a big issue that comes up is how are we going to, or at the time, how are we going to pay for this, this, uh, these expenses, right? Even though we were saving all this stuff, the war effort is very costly. How are we going to pay for this? So we estimated that the cost would be $20 billion. That was our estimate. But it turned out that the cost was actually $110 billion. Um, and $110 billion is a lot of money to most people. So uh, <laughs> you're probably wondering how we paid how we pay this off. So firstly, we did borrow money, um, and we did also increase income taxes. So income tax became 70%. 70% is a lot of your income. You only get to keep 30%. And obviously people didn't like this, but those that were for the war effort understood why it was necessary and went along with it. Then there was also war bonds, which was similar to a regular bond where they would have their peak, um, but the government cared about short-term memory, uh, uh, short-term um, money. Yeah, they cared about the short-term gain, so they did allow this to happen, and then they hoped that people would miss the peak of the money, and therefore they, would, they wouldn't get the cash in, and the government would still make a lot of money. Um, and they expected everyone to buy these board bonds. Um, then there was the draft. Josh, you want to get into the draft? All right, so the draft was the first time since Civil War that it was used, and everyone was entered. There was no buyout. You couldn't find a substitute. Everyone was entered the draft, who was a male between ages 18 and 45. And how it would work is they pick a date. They would pick many dates, actually. And on the first date they would pick, they would sudden in everyone who was born on that date. They'd all come in. they get interviewed if they're between 18 and 45. They had to go to the war unless they were dubbed a moron, which basically meant they were gay or had some weird illness because America didn't like gay people back then. And um, so that's how that worked. Some people objected for moral reasons, but most people actually entered the war. You could also volunteer. Uh, some people did, mainly poor people. But the main way people got into the World War One from America's side was the draft. Yeah, exactly. So um, one of the things that people could opt out for is also like religious purposes. So obviously, That's if something had to do with your religion, they would let you opt out. Um, that was mainly Quakers. Quakers didn't believe in the war. So. Yeah, yeah. And then in total, four million people were drafted. And, um, yeah, so uh, Wilson's original plan was that there would be these people that were drafted obviously would need to be trained because they were going to be traveling overseas and then fighting in Europe. Um, so he said that you would need to train for four months here and then go into Europe and then train for two months. Obviously, they were at a crunch for time. Um, if you know, Germany said that in the spring of 1917, they were going to, yeah, they were going to attack, and this was this time was coming up very close, so America had to move. And um, uh, what happened was that they didn't have this time to train the troops, so they directly went into Germany um, to start fighting. Um, and I guess the training was very minimal, um, and all they had to do was give them weapons and then say, use this. That's why the death toll was pretty high because they were not very uh, skilled. They didn't really know what they were doing, and if you give someone that, that doesn't know what they're doing a gun, that's obviously going to end badly. Well, the um, way the war worked, you didn't really need to be trained because they had trenches, and when yeah. you see the enemy, you run out of the trench, try to kill two before dying yourself, because if you keep on doing that every single time, you're going to win. Exactly. So as long as they had these four million people, they didn't really care because um, compared to Germany, they were at a very significant advantage, and that that really helped them um, in terms of numbers. Um, so, all right, Josh, you want to go into the League of Nations and then like the arguments with Henry Cabot Lodge? All right. So after the war ended and the Allies won our side. 
um, there needed to be a peace. Two months after the um, armistice was signed, there was a peace, um, the Treaty of Vers or Conference of Versailles, where they met. Um, America was kind of the odd one out because they wanted to be nice to Germany. I meant, yeah, nice to Germany, give them more territory, be more friendly, while um, England and France and Italy, the other Allied powers, wanted to take all of their land, split it amongst themselves. So there was some um, argument, and Wilson eventually compromised on these issues and let Germany, I mean, let France and England have some of this land, but he wouldn't have let that if there wasn't for this League of Nations. He's really set on having this League of Nations because, which is kind of the predecessor to the United Nations, because he thought it would end the wars forever. And the League of Nations, how it would work, is there would be a major council of the major powers, Japan, exactly. yeah. France, England, and America, and a general body of everyone else in the world who wants to join the League of Nations. And the and um this is what he wanted. And he eventually got it in the Treaty of Versailles. However, back in America, this group of people led by Henry Cabot Lodge um, said if you sign this uh, treaty and it has the League of Nations in it, we are not signing it. We're not ratifying it. But Wilson didn't uh, listen to it, and he brought it back to the to America. He's like, hey, what's up, guys? I have this treaty. It has the League of Nations in it. And the treaty eventually didn't get passed because Republicans led by Henry Cabot Lodge didn't want the uh, League of Nations in there because they thought it took power away from America and, brought, and they didn't want to be controlled by England, France, and uh, Italy. Yep. All right. Um, so then um, you have like so as far as decisions of the League of Nations goes, um, the voting had to be unit unanimous, and this is within the executive board or like the top five that Josh talked about: uh, U.S., England, France, Italy, uh, Italy, and Japan. And um, so, and if if one of these executive powers was involved in the decision that was being made, um, it would have to be a 4-0 instead of 5-0 because they would be excluded and they would not be uh, a part of the vote. Um, and then another issue that came up specifically was Article 10 of the League of Nations. And Article 10 was... The Treaty of Versailles, which dealt with the League of Nations. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so that had to do... That was very important because the, the arguments with uh, Lodge in America... Um, they were they were is pretty detrimental because they he did not he was uh, Wilson was very against splitting up um, League of Nations and the treaty and obviously Lodge was for it and he said that that's the only way that it could be revised and they could get rid of one if they wanted to. Um, so what what Lodge and all the other Republican senators in America did was they gave Wilson like it's called a round robin where people sign a paper in a circle, so he didn't actually know who signed first, and this was just telling Wilson that, like, um, we will vote down your treaty if you put it together. Um, we know Wilson is very, very uh, not compromising, so he said, um, okay, um, I don't really care about you guys, I'm going to do whatever I want. But he did need the support of the Senate in order to actually agree, or for the Amer uh, American population to agree to um, the signing of this uh, the treaty and if he didn't have that backup it would not happen so the book refers to this as like biting the hand of the person that feeds you uh, because if you like mess around with that what you want is never going to actually get done and he needed their support but Wilson's personality was such that he he didn't let that happen he's very stubborn and that led to problems um, and okay, so then you have like specifically how the treaty would um, eventually be voted on. First, you had the isolationists, then you had the irreconcilables, and you had de Democrats and Republicans. Isolations 
isolationists, they were people that did not like the war at all. So regardless of what you told them, they weren't going to vote for the treaty, they were against the war, they hated Wilson, they didn't like what he was doing, they didn't care about all his like moral diplomacy ideas, they didn't care about like um, the peace that he was promising. Um, so they were going to vote it down anyway. Wilson didn't even bother to appeal to these people because they were they were not his uh, area. Then you had the irreconcilables that also did not like the treaty. Um, Wilson didn't appeal to them either. But then you had Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Wilson himself was a Democrat, so he had the support of all the other Democrats um, in the general population. They basically swayed the vote which, uh, in every time when Wilson told them to either not vote for it or to vote for it. Um, and then you also had the um, revisionists. Um, some of them were mild, some of them were strong. Um, Lodge himself was a strong revisionist, so he was against what Wilson was doing. But then what, what would eventually sway the vote was if Wilson did or did not get the support of the mild revisionists. Um, and that's what he was hoping to do. The Democrat votes, votes plus the mild revisionist votes would be enough to actually pass the treaty. Um, so what happened is that Lodge has problems with the League of Nations that Wilson's presenting. So he tells, Wilson tells um, his, his friend Hitchcock, um, Alfred Hitchcock, to revise the the whole idea of the treaty, and then um, uh, wait, hold on a second. I think there's something wrong with. All right, I'll just continue here. So the first vote, um, there was well, the one wide revisions went up. Uh, Wilson didn't vote for Democrats, didn't vote for it, and it failed. And then uh, the final time it went up to vote was with some of um, law revisions and some more mild Democrat revisions. And Wilson actually didn't like this because there were some of Lodge revisions in there as well. So he told Democrats to vote no. And, uh, and only some Democrats listened to him. But those some Democrats plus irreconcilables and... Um, and the isolationist vote was enough to vote down the treaty. And once you've done it like three times, then you know it's done. That's when it was official that the treaty wasn't going to go down. And some Democrats didn't listen to Wilson because they knew the importance of the treaty. And Wilson knew the importance of the treaty, too. It's just that he would he wanted the treaty, but he'd rather have no treaty than a bad treaty. That was the whole deal with the treaty voting. Exactly. All right. Um, let's see. What's next? I guess we can talk about the specifics of how the fighting went down. So we already know that Wilson had two criteria that the troops were properly trained and that they were separate from the other, like, the the other armies that were among the allies. He didn't want everyone to come together because that would they they were they were on the same side, but they were also fighting for different purposes. Um, so what they did was they had like their specific like uh, sections along the western front. Yeah, what well, was there, that? there's a western front between Germany and France, and there was a French section and a British section. And America didn't want to fight on the French section or British section. They wanted to have their own uh, section. And they ended up having their own section. And the reason was because they were fighting on more moral ground instead of fighting for um, territory like France and Germany was. Yeah. Or so, France and England, not Germany. Germany wasn't fighting with the Allies. Yeah, so what happens is that um, as Germany warned, that spring they were going to make their final push. They knew that it was all or nothing because um, America definitely outnumbered them, and they knew if that if they didn't attack early enough, if they attacked too late, then America would completely come in and they would be destroyed. So their final push they had to make sure was the best, and when they did, 
America and uh, France and Britain, they did stop them, and they actually got pushed back even farther. So what happened now was that Germany was in a bit of a situation because they thought that their, their final push was going to help them, um, but now they had to achieve some sort of armistice because they were not, they had no chance now. Um, so on October 1918, Germany asked Wilson's for, Wilson for an armistice based on his 14 points. Um, they expected to receive all the benefits that Wilson had once advocated for uh, now that they were asking for peace. Um, but Wilson is a very nice person, and he says that um, he would do this, but he doesn't deal with dictators, and the current situation that Germany was under was under a di dictatorship. Um, so he said, fix this, get a democracy, and we will talk. So they did, they overthrew their current ruler, and with this democracy they came back to Wilson and they said, okay, now can you please help us with this? And uh, Wilson said, okay, sure, I will do this for you at the meeting of the Treaty of Versailles. I will sort of argue in your favor and we'll see what happens. Um, I'll do my best to help you. Um, this was because um, Wilson was in the war for different reasons. Great Britain and France, they were in it for like uh, the money, they were in it for the pride of winning, but America, as Wilson said, he was in it to end all wars, to end all future wars, um, to make peace. They had different motives, but they were all on the same side. So that brings us to um, like the, the different compromises. So Josh, you want to talk about compromises that were made between um, uh, All right. yeah. So basically what happened was, like I mentioned earlier, Wilson was really set on this League of Nations. So every single time, um, so what you had is you had America who wanted to help Germany. They weren't interested in making an enemy, while France and England, and um, they just wanted to take all of Germany's territory. Um, so whatever, so what happened was there's all these votes where... Um, France and uh, England were like, well, we want this territory. And then uh, Wilson was like, no, give it to the Germans. And then France and England was like, well, we're not joining the League of Nations if you give this to the Germans. So Wilson's like, whoa, I want you to join the League of Nations, so I'm going to compromise. You have it for 15 years, and then they will vote for it. And every time that these territories go for it, by the way, they voted to become part of Germany because they are German. So that mm -hmm. what happened, there's a lot of specifics. And another thing that happened was Austria-Hungary and Ottoman Empire, two major belligerents of the Central Powers, they were all split up in all these different countries. That's how you get a bunch of different countries, such as like Czechoslovakia, Turkey. They all come from getting split up. So that was the compromises. There's a lot of specifics, but don't really waste your time with that. You know, All right. Maybe. Just in case, I'm going to address quickly address the specifics just in case we have to know them. Um, first, you have... So what, the, what it came down to every time was Wilson or a country proposing something to Wilson where they'd be like, I want this. And then Wilson would be like, no. And they'd be like, okay, I'm not joining the League of Nations. And then he'd be like, okay, fine, I'll compromise. So specifically with France, France says that we were being too lenient on Germany after the war. And they said, let's take away the Rhine. Um, and that would mean that Germany would have to cross the river in order to invade anyone. Wilson originally says no. France says, okay, uh, say bye to your League of Nations. We're not joining. Then he's like, okay, let's compromise. The Rhineland can be neutral territory, and in 15 years... People will vote, and we'll see what happens. Then you have France, who takes the same approach. Um, okay, so France takes the same approach, and they say, uh, we want the Saar Basin. The Saar Basin is actually what was two-fifths of um, Germany's natural resources, and Wilson says, no, I'm not giving you two-fifths of Germany's natural resources. And then... Um, France says, okay, we're not joining the League of Nations. And then Wilson's like, all right, fine. You can have the Tsar Basin, and then in 15 years, the people will vote who they wish to join. Um, 
And then there was also the Mutual Security Pact, which said that um, if attacked, they would need allies. And then Wilson initially says no, but then they compromise. And this is, again, because of the whole League of Nations. Um, and then another, another compromise that was made after this was the reparations. Um, they said that um, uh, they would need to pay 60 billion, or Germany would need to pay 60 billion for what they, they destroyed. Wilson says, um, no, we'll, we'll agree at 25 billion. Um, all this time, Germany thinks that um, Wilson's totally like making, it, making a good deal with them. Um, and he's, he's working in their favor. But while Wilson is, he's very stubborn and wants the League of Nations. So anything to do that, he'll basically compromise on anything. So um, when he goes back and tells Germany that I did help you, but you still have to pay all this money, do all this, lose all this land, um, it still does come, back, come down to like um, a very big loss for Germany. Um, then there's also the... Uh, how... Germany has to blow up all their their U-boats and all their submarines. Um, that's also part of the compromise. And finally, um, Germany also has to sign the War of Guilt Clause. Uh, then you have the fact that as Josh mentioned, Austria-Hungary has broken up into different territories. The Ottoman Empire split up. Um, these aren't really Germany-related, so they don't really affect Germany, but they're another consequence or a compromise of the war um, in order to have the League of Nations. Um, and yeah, then it comes down to whether or not we get the League of Nations. So what happens is that after all this compromise that Wilson makes, he then goes back to America where Lodge is, and he he asks Lodge, like, he's like, okay, I did it, but he comes back and the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles are all still part of the same deal. Um, obviously, this goes against what Lodge had told Wilson to do. That's going to lead to problems, and that does lead to problems. Josh, you want to talk about the different times the 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 thing came up for vote, and then it was taken yeah, down, and then I already mentioned that. Huh? Did you? Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, if we covered that, then let's talk. Briefly, oh look, we have a question. So, Mr. Keshav Soda is uh, wondering: Did France eventually compromise for the security treaty? Uh, did they? Did they accept they wouldn't get the Tsar Basin or Rhineland as long as they got the security treaty? What? Wait, what was the question? Um, I'll let me copy and paste it into the uh, thing so. I, it's a very ambiguously worded question, but it has to do with the territory that was taken away from Germany after um, the war. Yeah, France um, did compromise for the security treaty. Um, the security treaty was passed in its entirety because you really can't compromise on that. It's either there is a security treaty or there's not. The security treaty is that America would um, help uh, France uh, or England if Germany invades them. Uh, but, of course, just signing this treaty doesn't do anything because they're just backed by moral reasons. There's no like physical consequences if America doesn't abide by the security treaty. Well, the security treaty did happen. All right. So now we're going to talk about the now we're going to talk about the election of 1920. There were two candidates. You have James Cox from Ohio. Um, he was a Democrat. He was in favor of the League of Nations. And then you have Warren G. Harding, and he's also from Ohio, and he said um, no to the League of Nations. Um, and this election is what Wilson, let me see, what was, what was the exact thing? He called it a solemn referendum because what he was hoping for is that people would vote for Cox and he'd be like, see, we want the League of Nations. But, of course, this failed miserably because Cox lost by a long shot to Harding. Yeah, so what we talked about in class was like Harding's idea of like being like, okay, 
we've been in a war for a long time, so I'm going to do nothing for you. I'm just going to sit around, do nothing, but the good thing is there's not going to be much pressure. You guys can, like, uh, recuperate after the war. You can get back into the swing of things. And, I'll we'll say. Yeah, so... Um, he wasn't one of those presidents. He, I, he, he got lucky because he came in at the time where people literally did want to relax after this war. They wanted to focus more on domestic policy than on foreign policy. And by saying that, all right, I'm going to make sure we don't we don't get into these foreign um, disputes. Yeah, foreign disputes. Um, I'm going to make sure that we literally do nothing and we just stay calm for a bunch of like four years or so. People were like, okay, let's vote for him. We're not going to get into any problems. We're just going to just sail for his term, and that will allow them to get back into the swing of things and, um, you know, get back into get back into it. So it, after, after Wilson, he was a very sharp contrast because he was very laid back and not a very a big part of it. One of the things we didn't mention was about how Wilson um, had a stroke. So what happened was after Wilson came back from um, Europe, he came and he wanted to convince as many, as many people as possible to vote for the treaty. At the same time, Lodge was saying, trying to tell people to, was trying to stall so that people would eventually forget about it and not think it was a big deal and then not vote on it. Um, but what Wilson was doing was going place to place, traveling, cross-country, giving these speeches about why we need the League of Nations, why we need the Treaty of Versailles, and he hoped to sway people's opinion. But this was very hectic. He is not very young anymore, and he he had a stroke. This stroke was very detrimental because it would mean that he would not be able to speak to his cabinet. He had to stay in his office uh, in, at, in the White House all the time. He couldn't really communicate with the public, couldn't make decisions. So what people think was that instead of Wilson at the time, who was the president, that should have been making the decision, it was actually his wife that was pretty much doing everything for him um, because Wilson was in this desperate um, this desperate state. So um, eventually that all died out, and as we know, the League of Nations never was voted or agreed upon by America. So this is sort of like the situation that we talked about where um, it's like, we there was there was a like say I were to host a party and then not show up at my own party because League of Nations was Wilson's idea. This was his huge revolutionary idea that he really thought was going to help a lot of people. That was never actually um, happened. Never actually happened. So uh, the book, the textbook in particular, like to put it into um, into Power. like think, thinking about it as like a table with the big four: Great Britain, France. Um, Italy and, uh, and America, and thinking of it as America not showing up, you have a table with three legs, not four legs. Obviously, it can't balance, so the whole plan collapsed, and we actually don't know to this day if the League of Nations would really have given us world peace, would really have set this up. Now we have the United Nations, which this was like built on, but the League of Nations was never put into effect. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I want to give a shout-out to Victor Dadfer, for being a senior and still watching our um, broadcast. All right, Josh. So now you want to talk about people? All right. Specific so people. Real quick, we talked about most of them. Let me just go over this real quick. So chapter one, peace without victory. Uh, that's a Wilson promise during his 1916 election bid. Uh, that basically said we didn't want to get into war. We'll just negotiate peace in Europe. And we won't get into war. There'll be no victors. It'll be fun. That didn't happen. We got into war. Unlimited somewhere marine warfare. What Germany raged on us. That's why I went to war. Arthur Zimmerman was a Germany German foreign minister who sent the Zimmerman telegram to Mexico, telling them to get into war. And by the way, that was intercepted by the British. We weren't. It wasn't to us by any means. And then the British told us about it, and then we were like, whoa, they can't do this. All right, so for Wilsonian idealism, Jeanette Rankin, um, she was a senator 
uh, from Montana. I don't know why people live there, but another thing. Uh, this is a woman. She voted against the war. Notable pa pacifist. One of the first women senators. And then the 14 points. We didn't really talk about this, this that much. Uh, Wilson said that at the beginning of the war. Uh, these were like things that he said that were kind of that you would hope to achieve after the war. Most of them were friendly towards Germany, and that's why Germany wanted America to brokerage the Treaty of Versailles. However, Britain and France kind of got rid of these while Wilson was set on the League of Nations. All right, before we get into the next thing, let's give a shout-out to Sangho Lee for watching. He's not even a Morris Hills High School student. He's from Randolph High School, but he's one of our dedicated viewers. Um, yeah, so you can continue with the uh, Committee of Public Information, right? All right, Committee of uh, Public Information, headed by George Creel. They basically just sent out pamphlets and posters saying support the war effort. We really need all hands on deck. It's mainly propaganda. Then there was the Four Minute Men. Uh, they were um, given topics by the Committee of Public Information, and they were volunteers. They gave speeches all over the country, telling people to join the war effort. Um, they weren't actually four minute speeches; most of them ran off longer. The Hun was kind of a derogatory nickname for Kaiser Wilhelm of uh, Germany because it kind of shows that he's very barbaric and evil. Over there was what we call Germany, yeah, and it also shows yeah. that... Over, over there was actually a song that was, like, supposed to be... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, that was supposed to be at, like, um, Germany, yeah. Okay, um, and also, George Creel, I don't know if you said this, Josh, but he was, like, the head of the Committee, committee on Public Information. He was basically in charge. Um, he didn't really have much power because this was all under, like, patriotic volunteerism, but he was, like the person that was chosen by Wilson to, like, be in charge. Um, yeah. All right, let's talk about Liberty Cabbage. Liberty Cabbage was what the people of America called sauerkraut at the time. They wanted to be as far away from German things as possible. Yeah, it was, like, a time of um, shunning of the Germans, anyone that was German, because there were actually a lot of Germans in... Um, there were yeah. a lot of Germans in uh, yeah. America, and uh, they were all like, segregated, and they were all, like, considered to be Huns, and there's big deals going on with them. Then the Espionage Act was that, um, espionage means, like, spying, so if you were caught spying or doing anything against the war effort, hindering it in any way, you would be put in jail. Um, and, for example, there was, oh, there was also the Sedition Act, which made it illegal to print or write anything that was against the war efforts, and so Eugene V. Debs, and William D. Haywood, they were both charged for violating the uh, Sedition Act, and they were put into jail for 10 years um, because of this. Then, Josh, let's talk. We can talk about Bernard Baruch and the War Industries. Bill. Haywood, Haywood, if you don't remember, he was the guy in charge of the um, industrial workers of the world, and Eugene V. Davis was a socialist. All right, so Bernard Baruch, he. Um, well, was chosen to head the War Industries Board. Didn't have a lot of power. Fizzled after the war. And they just tried to get the industries ready for war. And this was kind of hard because there was no, like, free gaming, so to speak. Because um, Wilson said he wasn't going to go to war. So how could he prepare the war um, industries beforehand? He couldn't. So War Industries Board had to get the industries ready um, very quickly. Labor also had to get ready really quickly. So that's why they issue the work or fight, basically discouraging people from striking, basically saying if you don't work and you go on strike, you're going into the war because they don't want strikes as we needed production. National War Labor Board kind of facilitated this. And then there's the international worker, industrial workers of the world. They were called wobblies by people who were like anti because they thought it was, they didn't like unions. That's why they're called wobblies. And industrial workers of the world were against the war. That's why people also don't like them. All right, so women's suffrage. There's the NAWSA and Women's Bureau. Um, they were both um, groups. 
for uh, uh, the war, uh, for suffrage. And yeah, the there. NAWSA stands for the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Oh, where did Josh go? Did he... His cell phone battery probably died. All right. National American Women's Suffrage Association was supporting Williams, uh, Wilson's war efforts. They were rewarded with the amendment that gave them the right to vote. Then there was the 19th Amendment. So then there was the Women's Bureau that um, they were, like, put into the workplace. Oh, oh, Josh, are you back? Yeah. It just unfortunately stopped for some weird reason. All right, so so we just talked about the the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the Women's Bureau. Now uh, you want to talk about like Food Administration, Herbert Hoover. I mean, we covered all that stuff, but I mean, we can go into it really quickly. All right, so Food Administration that was led led by Herbert Hoover. Um, Needless Tuesdays was just an example of one of the days that they have on uh, 18th Amendment, uh, what was it, 18th Amendment, what was that again? 18th Amendment, um, 18th Amendment had to, had to do, hold on, my thing is, yeah, so 18th Amendment had to do with the prohibition. That wasn't actually oh, okay. talked about, yeah. Wasn't actually talked about too much within the chapter, but whatever it was, prohibition um, that didn't last long, and liberty bonds, like we mentioned, were what they called savings bonds. All right, so there's not a lot of things. Um, America helps hammer the pun. John J. Pershing, he was the main guy in charge. Marshal Falk, he was the guy. He was a French commander, actually. And he was a general in charge of the Western Front, which was the main part that we were involved in. And he was the first commander in the war to have control of all nations' armies. Uh, John J. Pershing commanded the American section of the war. Um, Blackjack Pershing, you should remember him from Mexico. And he really helped um, hold off the... Views are gone on um, offensive, uh, which was the Germans attacking our front, and we held them back, and that's when Germany called for peace. All right, so where are we at, Josh? We're at Alvin York. Alvin York. He's what, not question, what question was that? Twelve. All right, Alvin York. Uh, Josh, you want to talk about Alvin York? He was a soldier during World War One, and he was hailed as a hero because he killed a lot of uh, Germans and people. Use an example like, "Be like Alvin York. He's so good." Um, that oh. was. Yeah, one more thing that we, we didn't actually mention. Um, uh, this is what, like, um, after after the war, um, Wilson was Wilson was considered to be like so great in the Europe in in Europe because like they thought that like he was the source of like helping them win the war, helping German power German lose power. So when people would go around and they would shake hands, they were they were so happy. That they instead of saying like oh hello nice to meet you they would say like Wilson Wilson instead of like saying like how are you they'd be like Wilson because that was some sort of like there was some sort of like way to give give him respect for all that he had done um, yeah so that's a little bit of fun fact right there um, yeah so then we talked about the armistice uh, Germany wanted the armistice because they realized they had no chance of winning Wilson said get rid of your dictator. They said, sure. They had a democratic government. Wilson said, okay, I'll do whatever I can to help you. But you, we know he was very stubborn, and because of this, uh, because of his stubbornness, he he wasn't able to um, fully compromise and get Germany the best benefits because of the the other countries 
holding it against the League of Nations, saying they wouldn't join unless Germany lost this, unless they got this from Germany. Um, all right, then you have Henry Cabot Lodge. That was, like, Wilson's opponent. He was a Republican head of the Senate. Um, he was the one who gave the round robin to um, Wilson that said, if you have the Treaty of Versailles and the uh, League of Nations together, we're going to vote it down. It's in your best interest to separate them. Wilson doesn't listen. That leads to problems because the League of Nations is never enacted. Um, then we have Victor or Victoria Orlando, David Lloyd George, and George Clemen, uh, Clemen Sue, Sue. I don't know how to pronounce that last name. Clemen uh, Yeah, so they were, they were each specific leaders of... Um, the different powers. Josh, you want to get into uh, that? All right. So, Vittorio Orlando, he was the oldest one. He Italy. Was he was the Italy, Italy guy. I was getting to that. Yeah. David Lloyd George was England. Clemenceau was France. Those were the leaders of the major powers. That's what you should know about that. And then, hammering out the treaty, William Bora and Hiram Johnson were part of the irreconcilables saying we don't want any treaty, we don't want to have a treaty for this war with all the other powers. They were against treaty to reside there in the no vote. And Bora and Johnson, what they would do is when Wilson went on his big cross-country speaking tour, they would follow him, and on every stop that Wilson went to, they would also go there and say, don't vote for this treaty, don't listen to... Okay, Mom. Well. That sucks to play. Alright. And then... No. And then, um, don't listen to Wilson. All right, we're almost done. The last terms, I'll just finish up here. Warren Harding, he was the president after um, Wilson. James and Cox was who he beat, and Harding won because he wanted normalcy. And that pretty much wraps it up. Any last questions? Yeah. <laughs> If anyone has any questions, now is the time to ask them. You have like three or four minutes to ask your questions. Um, yeah. If you have any uh, questions, you should probably ask them now. About anything. Literally, we'll, we'll answer all your questions. The test is tomorrow for uh, kids that have history on A days. test is on Tuesday for people who have it on B days. I can see the viewer count. There's a lot of you watching this. I'm sure you guys have questions, um, particularly Sang Ho. I, I think Sang Ho has a lot of questions. I don't know why he's not asking. Um, oh, yes. Shout out to Gordon, Gordon Chu for being another one of our lore viewers. Oh, we're getting in a question from Mr. Samir Jain. Um... All right, here, Josh, I'll send you the question and we can answer it. Okay. <sighs> Hold on. Just a second. There was no law permitting labor strikes. In fact, the time after the war... Well, there was law permitting labor strikes during the war, but after the war there wasn't, and there's actually a lot of labor strikes after the war, which was part of the reason why the League of Nations never got passed, because people are more interested in that than in foreign affairs. And um, the Constitution yeah. Amendment granting women the right to vote was um, kind of a result of the war. Um, it was actually a result of the National Association... Or National yeah, the Women's National American uh, Women's Suffrage Association. They, as I said, was like, they were actually in support of the war. They were the few women that were, and then uh, Wilson said, like, okay, I see you guys helping us. We're going to give you the right to vote. As you remember, his first, uh, his first term, he didn't really touch on the issue of women at all, but on the second his second term, he really understood that they were helping him, and then that was sort of a reward. So to answer no, the it question... it wasn't a result of the war, but the war allowed women to prove... Yeah. Or give them a venue to achieve 
Sucked for yeah, you. so that, that question is like, I know it's in like our multiple choice question, uh, the true or false thing, but it's very ambiguously worded, and there's no like specifically um, an answer to that because it, it's in, open to interpretation. All right, we're going to wait for a few lingering questions. Um, please, if you comment on the feed, remember to keep it appropriate. Many of you have not. Huh. And thank you, Obama, for listening. <laughs> it's I know you more than things to do with your health care, but I'm glad that you're listening to this instead. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. All right, is there any questions in the comments, Josh? I can't see them right now. No. Just lewd comments. All right. I think that concludes this. Oh. What? Um, I, know, I was just looking if there were questions. I thought I saw one. Can we wrap this up? All right. Yeah, it looks like I didn't... Hold on. Oh, looks like I'm getting a question. One second. Someone's typing. Just a second. Oh, let's give a shout out to Josh Leopold, who is also a Randolph student that's also watching uh, right now. All right. All right, yeah, so looks like no one has any more questions. Hopefully we helped you. Um, right before we end this, I'm, go I'm going to talk about a little bit of revisions that we're making to swag test prep. Um, um, and it's what, what's going to happen right now is that we're going to be expanding to different subjects. One of the subjects that we're expanding to is computer science. Another is calculus. And uh, we hope to do this really soon. So if you need help in either calculus or computer science, you should probably subscribe. And in the near future, we'll be adding, adding this in to help you. Um, there's going to be two very qualified students that are willing to help you guys. I mean, me and Josh would love to do it, but we don't have all this time to dedicate just to making like these videos. So we have friends that are willing to do it, and we're, we're sure that you will benefit from that. So it seems like we do not have any more questions at the moment. Um, yeah. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but thanks for tuning in and learning more about World War One. Peace. Um, we'll do another one on, yeah. The Roaring Twenties soon on the next All right. Time. Adios. My Are computer's frozen. Hold on a second. Josh, can you hear me? Yeah.